Yo, oh my goodness. Okay. Hello. Welcome back to Write More Light with the Midwest Writing Center. Um, so you are probably looking at your screen right now and going, wow, this is not Sarah. Who's this hooligan? Um, so if you're a longtime viewer of Write More Light, you might know who I am. If not, hi, I'm Ava Miller. Um, I am a friend of Sarah's and her cat sitter. Um, and Sarah is currently on a plane right now. So she asked me if I could take over write more light duties for this week. And so I'm delighted to be here. Um, and for this week's write more light, I want to complain. I have some complaints. Um, not about anybody here. Um, everybody in the Midwest Writing Center is great and I love them all. Um, also, I promise I have more qualific qualifications than just being Sarah's cat sitter. I am also a writer um, and I've been involved with the Midwest Writing Center since I was 17. So that's about five or six years. Um, but yeah, uh, I have always wanted to be a YouTuber um, and I have wanted to be a YouTuber so that I can complain on the internet. Um, and so that's what we're going to be doing today. I would like to talk about bad books. Um, so get ready for some hot takes. It's going to be absolutely delightful. Um, so uh, just like, you know, before anything gets started, I just wanted to put a little disclaimer here and say that um, obviously badness is super su subjective. Um just because I, this random little person on your screen is saying that a book is bad does not make the book bad. Um, it's just my personal opinion that I think it's bad. Um, if it's a book that you absolutely love, I am by no means saying that you are bad. Um, you're a great person, no matter what, if you're watching this, if you're watching this, you're great. Um, but yeah, uh, just know that if I'm saying that a book is bad, it's by no means a personal attack on anybody, um, especially not the author. Um, you know, writing is all about your thoughts and feelings, and um, you shouldn't let anybody change that for you unless you want to. Um, anyway, um, so what do I mean when I say that a book is bad? I am saying that um, something that I've found in it is just not to my standards. Um, and I'd say that's different than what my taste is. Um, I wanted to bring up the concept before we get started about, um, books that are just simply not to my tastes and books that are bad, quote unquote bad. Um, and so, uh, an example of a book that is not to my personal taste is um, Dune by Frank Herbert. Um, I got started reading Dune back in high school and I had to quit because I was really bored. Um, and there's just so much lore involved in that book that you really have to keep uh, be up on and keep track of throughout the entire time you're reading. Um, and yeah, I just was not willing to put in that commitment. Um, I don't know about all copies of Dune, but my copy of Dune had a um a glossary in the back or an index of all of the specific terms that frank herbert had invented um that he wanted you to keep track of throughout the entire time that you were reading dune so i was constantly flipping back and forth and having to read through this index which i just was not having um and so that's why i ended up putting it down um and this is me saying that that is not ex that is not per se a bad book it's just one that i wasn't able to put the necessary time and attention in. So I really am not the person to judge if that is bad or not. Um, I have had friends say that they think the book is bad, but I've also had friends say the book is really, really good. And it's like their favorite thing ever. And they absolutely love the high sci-fi. Um, and that's great for them. I'm really glad for them. It just was not for me. Um, so there's an example of a book that was just not to my tastes. So let's get started on the hot takes, shall we? Um, well, probably my first example of a bad book is not a hot take whatsoever. Um, I actually made a list back in high school on my phone about um, 
books that I think are bad. Um, and I'll give you some examples of why I think they're bad um, as we're going along. Um, and then again, just because I say they're bad does not mean that they are bad. Maybe like for this one, first of all, in, in public opinion, it is widely considered to be bad. But again, that does not mean that you suck if you love this book. So my first example is Twilight by Stephanie Meyer. Holy bejeebus. Um, this is a book that I read in middle school. Um, and even then, middle school, Ava was going, wow, this is <laughs> bad. Um, so if you don't know what Twilight is, where have you been? But also, um, it's about uh, a girl who falls in love with a 100 something year old vampire and she is a teenager so there's all kinds of you know morality there um but it's it's a it's a teen drama um and uh it's the entire four book series is a love triangle between the girl bella and then edward the vampire and jacob the werewolf i was squarely on team jacob because he knows how to interact with people um edward is just a mess but um yes uh twilight is widely considered to be bad for those reasons um the consent reasons that i was talking about earlier but then just because it's so so melodramatic and um especially over the course of four books um, a lot of the story that you're getting is just a lot of people pouting, um, and there's character development is a strong word for it, um, but a lot of it is people sulking, and this is why people hate it so much. Also, the movies. Um, I know the movies got a... I'm a film major, so I'm going to be bringing up movie adaptations a lot, but um, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the complaints with the um, movie adaptation were that the acting was just bad. Um, I think both uh, Robert Pattinson and Kristen Stewart have both kind of redeemed themselves in the public eye upon um, reevaluation of the Twilight movies. So um, a lot of it is now chalked up to the fact that they were both inexperienced when they took the parts and didn't really know how to act yet. Um, and that's why people think that both the books and movies are bad. Um, but um, more from a writing perspective, my big problem when I was reading Twilight was that, um, again, the melodrama was such a big part of it. And I was really starting to go insane. Um, the Stephanie Meyer had some writing tics that just really got under my skin, again, even as a middle schooler. Um, I remember that she would describe Edward every like two seconds and would take these enormous paragraphs to describe his sparkly skin and those amber eyes and his flowing hair. And it was like, okay, I know what he looks like. I've been reading these books for a hot minute. Um, sorry, someone's driving slowly outside my house. Anyway, um, yeah, um, and that was that was a consistent thing throughout all of the books um and describing edward even though we already know he, what he looks like um bella was incredibly whiny and incredibly emotionally immature um did not listen to her father which you know um when you're that age and you are a teenager that's more relatable but once you get some outside perspective you're like wow girl your entire life does not need to revolve around two guys that is very unhealthy please seek help um and that that annoyed me quite a bit um back as a child um and then i know a lot of people were mad about the vampire aspect and it's like look i am i'm a mythology person too i like to uh I like to have rules for a certain type of supernatural creature and have those be stuck with. And if you're going to break the rules, make them in an interesting way, not just that vampires can't go in the sun or they'll sparkle. Like, that's cheesy. Um, and I know a lot of people hated that. I definitely hated it too as a middle schooler. Um, but the big thing with Twilight were the soliloquies. Every single 
like page had this this enormous paragraph of like I'm so sad and here's why and it was just this incredibly long dramatic speech by Bella um about why she was sad and why she was angsty and wow um I I don't I kind of blocked them out of my mind to be honest um because the writing in those soliloquies was just so ultra dramatic and sappy and just ugh, for me um and I decided when I was in middle school I I was thinking you know what I'm going to put myself through this uh Ava's not a quitter we're gonna go through the entire series and we're gonna see if it ever gets better spoiler alert it did not um so what I'm saying is that I suffered through all four of these books and it genuinely messed up my writing for um, at least a month afterwards. Not that I was by any means a talented and accomplished writer as a middle schooler. I was definitely still writing Star Wars fanfic, but my Star Wars fanfic was now trash. Like I remember writing this story and I was like, I'm giving this character the exact same kind of monologue that Bella would have had. And I was like, I can't be doing this. And so I think I, I genuinely stopped writing for at least a month because I was picking up Stephanie Meyer's writing traits. Um, and that's in my personal opinion, the biggest reason why Twilight is a bad book, um, just because of the poorly, how poorly written it is. Um, and then uh, I wanted to go into another book that I believe is poorly written, and this one will certainly be a hot take, and that is The Shining by Stephen King. Um, so like I said, I'm really into film, um, which is cringe, I know, but um, so I'm really into film. And uh, if you, if you again, if you are a longtime watcher of Write More Light, uh, you'll know that I'm a big fan of horror. I was on Sarah's uh, episode of Write More Light uh, on horror and what makes a good horror book um or movie and uh so one of my favorite um uh horror movies of all time is The Shining. I love The Shining by Stanley Kubrick so much. I think it's got um all kinds of uh really good filming techniques. Um I think it's got really good story beats too um and uh seeing all of this happening is just uh watching the whole thing unfold is something that never gets old for me and seeing i think i think uh stanley kubrick has a really good grasp of liminal space if you know what that is and so making uh the overlook hotel seem both very familiar and very um absent from reality at the same time is just incredible to me um and i want to be a filmmaker like Stanley Kubrick one day, except not torturing the actors. Anyway, um, so enough of me loving on The Shining movie. Um, I had, I think I first saw The Shining, the movie, um, the Stanley Kubrick movie, I should specify, when I was in like seventh or eighth grade. Um, and then my freshman year of high school, I was like, I'm going to read the book. I'm going to see, um, cause I had, I had heard all of the lore about how Stephen King absolutely hated Stanley Kubrick's version of The Shining and how terrible he thought it was and how he messed up the characters and the ending and how it was so bad. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to read the book and see what, what my personal opinion is. Maybe I'll be completely swayed and, um, I'll be, I'll, I'll totally agree with Stephen King because, you know, Stephen King is widely considered to be a really good author. Um, or at least, you know, um, public perception is that he's a very, very accomplished author, so he must be accomplished for some reason. Um, and I know a lot of people do or agree or disagree with that. Um, I know that uh, my mom personally is a really big Stephen King fan, and she loves to read his books. Um, and so that was kind of my main reasoning for reading The Shining is that, um, well, my mom loves Stephen King, so... Um, Anyway, I read the book my freshman year of high school and I was disgusted. I hated the book um, more than like anything. Um, and I still um, I still kind of hold those feelings. But again, a lot of the examples I'm going to be given are ones that I discovered when I was in high school. Um, and so I was even more angsty in high school than I am now. And so a lot of these opinions are probably going to be lessened by time. Um, but anyway, um, I wrote this little secret review for myself for when I do become an ultra famous YouTuber. 
Um, and uh, so just um, let me take you through a few of the story beats from both The Shining book and movie, um, and we'll compare. So um, yeah, if you don't know The Shining, it's about um, Jack Torrance, Wendy Torrance, and Danny Torrance all move into the Overlook Hotel for a winter so that they can just, you know, keep an eye on it. Um, and the Overlook has this scary history of haunting and uh, supposedly a, the old caretaker killed his children and went insane. Um, and uh, so in the movie, um, it's kind of clear from the outset that Jack Torrance is not a guy to be trusted. He is kind of a weird, creepy guy um, played by Jack Nicholson, who at that time was very, very well known for um, just playing kind of some skeezy characters and not really um, one to be trusted. Um, and that was one of the big problems that uh, Stephen King had at the uh, beginning of the movie. He's like, this guy can't be played by Jack Nicholson. Uh, Jack Torrance is supposed to be a family man. He's supposed to, like his descent into madness, spoilers, um, his descent into madness over the course of the book is supposed to be um, a surprise. Um, I think that's a terrible idea. Um, I, I don't know why you would make that story choice. I think that the story comes off so much better when you know that a character is a ticking time bomb. That's the impression that I get from Jack the entire time. Um, as he's driving like the famous shot of like the overhead shot of the overlook while the family's driving through the mountains. Um, like you can, you the foreboding is like, it's, it's palpable there with the like creepy music and all. Um, and uh, so, I th that's what I think personally works so well. Stephen King tried to hide it for a long time that Jack is going to um, try to go after his family eventually. Um, and yeah, um, I don't think that really makes much sense. I think that the entire tension of the movie comes from the fact that Jack is just waiting to explode. Um, but uh, there's some uh, things in The Shining, if you are familiar with horror, that are super iconic, um, the hedge maze for one. Um, and then the creepy twins, you've got the twins standing at the end of the hallway going like, come play with us, Danny. Um, and I was so shocked that both of those things were not in the book at all. Um, so it is known that the previous caretaker of the Overlook Hotel, um, at least in the book, it's clear that he did kill his family. Um, I can't remember. I. I can't remember if he still had twin daughters in the book. I think he had an older and a younger daughter. Um, but in the movie, the ghosts of the daughters that the uh, previous uh, caretaker killed manifest in front of Danny the child and are like creepy in front of him. And that's like his big reason for being scared because he can see them and nobody else can't. That's The Shining um, is your ability to see ghosts. Um, and that's not present in the book, which I found really surprising because, like, um, I can't remember the character's name, but I, I know I wrote it down. Scatman Carruthers. No, um, Halloran, Dick Halloran. He is the other character that has the shine. Um, and so he and his, he and his grandma can see ghosts, so can Danny. And so he tells Danny about, yeah. Um, but, uh. Where was I? I was talking about the twins. Yes, the twins are not present in the book. The like creepy ghost thing, which doesn't make much sense. But then also the hedge maze, the iconic hedge maze um, is these like hedge animals. Um, it's like a topiary garden, um, which is, I think is an interesting idea, but then it manifests in like the animals coming to life and like attacking Danny, which is weird to me. Maybe it's just because I'm used to the movie. Um, who knows, but, um, the, um, but the hedge maids, uh, comes in really big at the end when, um, Danny is running around through the hedge maze and Jack is following him, trying to, uh, kill him. Um, it's a very iconic scene in the movie. Um, but then there's two major departures that, um, I know that Stephen King had a really big problem with, um, with the movie. Um, one of them is that, again, spoilers, um, Halloran dies in the movie when he doesn't in the book. Um, this was 
Uh, I know in recent years it's being reevaluated and being seen as racist because Halloran is black and the rest of the characters are white. Um, and so I do want to acknowledge that that is problematic. Um, uh, but that's what uh, Stephen King was mostly talking about because Halloran is like the one that saves them, saves uh, Wendy and Danny at the end. Um, and uh, so in the movie, there's this big arc about like Danny and Halloran are able to connect through the shine and um, see each other. And that's how Halloran knows to come to um, the Overlook to try to save them. And then Jack just kills him immediately. Um, and so it's kind of, at least in my personal opinion, I think that that's really effective in terms of horror. Definitely not in terms of like social progress. That is really not a positive ideal to show but it's very effective in terms of horror because you're showing a character coming into the situation it's like the knight in shining ar armor you've got this deus ex machina character and then he's just gone um which i think really heightens the horror in that sense um but again uh probably not the best idea in terms of conveying uh, a proper attitude towards race um it, it kind of shows the wrong idea um but uh the second big departure that Stephen King got mad about is the ending. Again, major spoilers here. Um, so in the uh, in the book, uh, the a big part of the the book was like, don't let the boiler get to a certain level. You've got to pay attention to the boiler, or the entire hotel will explode. Um, so as soon as Halloran gets Wendy and Danny out. Um, Jack kind of has this moment of clarity where he's like, wow, I've been a terrible father. I'm going to blow up the hotel with the boiler and then that's how he dies. Um, and then Wendy and Danny and Halloran live happily ever after, hooray. Um, but the the movie's a lot more ambiguous. Um, uh, so you, again, Halloran dies, so he's not there to help them out. Wendy and Danny escape, they're going through the hedge maze. Um, Danny with his quick wits is able to find his way out and Jack freezes to death in the hedge maze. Um, and so there's that iconic shot of Jack like freezing in the in the snow. Um, and then Wendy and Danny supposedly escape. And then that's just kind of how it ends. Um, again, with the creepy image at the end, that's a whole different thing. But um, the book doesn't have that. It's a very happy tied up in a bow kind of ending um, in the book. And this is something else that Sarah and I were talking about during the horror episode is that... Um, I think a lot of the least effective horror endings are the types that just are wrapped up in a bow, give wrap to you, all good, all done. Um, then there's nothing to think about. Um, I mean, there's the like, you know, the fridge aspect of um, when you like after the movie's done, you go to the fridge and then as you're looking into the fridge, you go, oh, dang, like, I just thought about this crazy thing that uh, I just realized that makes this movie 10 times scarier. Maybe that occurs, but not in a book not in a bow ending in my opinion um you've just got everything wrapped up it for you handed to you on a silver platter and uh when the movie ends in an ambiguous way it's like there's more to think about it's like wow what if that kind of thing happens to me like what did wendy and danny survive are they okay is jack gonna unthaw and become the caretaker all over again like um that's something to think about and then the book just really does not have that but i can't believe i almost forgot to talk about this the biggest problem that i have with the book is that jack and wendy are constantly having sex all throughout the book it drove me nuts i mean you know especially as a freshman in high school i didn't really want to read about parents having sex but um a lot of the situations in the book that danny gets into like i was talking about how the animals in the topiary attack him that's because jack and wendy were up having sex they were not paying attention to him at all and that's what really drove me crazy is that especially when there's these two characters i know they're supposed to be family people in the book but they're just so like latched onto each other that like they're not paying attention to their literal four-year-old son um and uh, yeah it was driving me crazy um and uh it felt I mean, I don't want to, again, no, no, if Stephen King, if you're watching this, I don't know why you would be, but Stephen King, if you're watching this, um, this is not a personal attack to you, but it really felt like Stephen King was compensating for something. Um, just the, um, the sheer amount of like carnal 
attitudes and like he described it too it was in very graphic detail um i won't go into it because this is a family show but um it was it was really gross to me and then there's nothing like that in, in the movie and i think that goes to show in the movie that like there is no attraction to each other and so there's really no reason to assume like oh jack loves his family and that's why he'd never touch them like there's that's not there jack would totally attack his family because he seems to not like love them um and so that's a really kind of creepy thing there um but yeah so I would not recommend reading the book. My mom talked to me and like, after I said I hated The Shining, she was like, well, it's like Stephen King's, like one of his earliest novels, if not the first one. And I was like, okay, I'll give him a pass. And then apparently there's like, you know, like pre-cocaine, post-cocaine Stephen King, and then like pre-accident, post-accident Stephen King. So I really have not read through his entire oeuvre. So, um, I am kind of a bad judge of if Stephen King is a bad author or not. I don't think he is. I just think that The Shining is a bad book. Anyway, carrying on, um, I have, I think I have two more really hot take books here. Um, the first one that I will go into is The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. I hated that book. It was so bad. Um, and again, this is one that I, I didn't write down in my little note document, so I don't uh, have that strong of a memory of it um and I also intentionally tried to block it out of my mind because I thought it was really bad um but um uh the girl with the dragon tattoo is written by like Stig Larsson I think is his name uh he's a Norwegian or Swedish I can't remember some Scandinavian author um and um he wrote this trilogy of books and then died um, did not get them published and so his family found them and decided to publish them for him which I think is a bad idea um, if you are at all familiar with like current events in the music industry there's a lot of like author um, musicians that have died um, their back catalog kind of being released without their permission um, I think that's the same kind of thing with a book um, I don't think sometimes the books are just meant to be for yourself like I know that you know a lot of writing is very um personal and beneficial and if you want to share that with others that's great but um sometimes things are just meant for yourself and that's okay and I think that that's the case with the girl with the dragon tattoo because again content warning um for some kind of heavier topics um there's a lot of sexual assault in the girl with the dragon tattoo um and that's a major reason why it did not work for me um and so the main character is um a sexual assault survivor um and she ends up again i will watch my words carefully here but she ends up using very similar tactics against her attacker that were used against her if you know what i'm saying so that's the kind of morality that just does not fly like you, you can't go there um and uh the reason why i'm saying that this book shot probably should have been for the author and the author alone is because he witnessed um when he was like 15 he witnessed an event similar to what happened in the book and i think he wrote the book as a sort of cathartic um way out of uh what he had witnessed and wanted to um kind of express his guilt for not doing anything um and uh it just it got public and now it's a movie and now his feelings about all of this really heavy stuff is being broadcast to the world which i just think is personally very unethical and i don't like it um anyway uh moving on to some much lighter topics but still a hot take um the goldfinch wow i hated that book and i got like oh my god okay so the goldfinch um if you're into movies recently you probably know what the goldfinch is um it just had a uh movie adaptation which absolutely tanked completely flopped uh starred uh, uh ansel elgort and just no money they and they made no money um and I actually uh, wrote an entire essay about this for my media class in college um, about how uh, this, I, I believe that this book was just um, 
written to fulfill a cycle of book to movie adaptations and then as soon as it flopped they just cast it aside um because uh so the goldfinch uh i don't even really know what it's about um because i quit reading it so this is another uh this is another like you know disclaimer for me is that i probably am not the best source on this book because i did not finish it um i hated it so much that i quit um and it's it's like it's a it's a tome it's like 800 pages long and i got maybe 150 pages in um and but anyway the book is about this kid whose mother dies in a terrorist attack and then there's like a goldfinch painting and then he goes into a life of crime and something like that um but it's written by donna tart who is kind of a i want to say like a buzzword kind of author um, she's one that I hear a lot of people talking about, but like I've I've heard friends and stuff talking about her, and then I see nothing else that she's done. Like she won a Pulitzer Prize for the Goldfinch, which I think is total BS. But again, that's just my personal opinion. Um, but I she's kind of a non-entity as as an author goes. Um, I, it seems like she's just one who kind of pops up, pops out a book and then goes. Um, and again, there's nothing wrong with having a mysterious persona, but, um, it, it, it seems to me very manufactured. Um, and that's a lot of why I gave up on the book is because actually, let me go back to my notes here. Um, uh, it, the pacing was just so, so, so slow and like dreary. And I was like, I have no idea where this is going. Um, I'm just really confused and bored, and so I just gave up. Um, but I did, um, for my paper, I did some more research into the book, um, and a lot of what I found out is that the critics who initially reviewed it said that she was, uh, Donna Tartt, the author, was really good at just listing, like, big lists of nouns and, like, really good at giving description um, and kind of uh, showing a scene. Um, and obviously that did not strike with me. I'm I'm more of a dialogue person anyway, so um, uh, that really would have not resonated with me. Again, it, just pointing out my bias here. Um, but um, yeah, uh, the um, the big problem that I was seeing was that it was just so slowly paced. Um, but then critics, uh, when the book first came out, I don't remember when it was. Um, but it came out like 10 years ago, I think. Um, but it was just being heaped with praise about like, um, how like what a creative story it was with so much heart. And then like, I don't know if you've got, if you've seen that meme about like, um, back of the book bingo, where it's like, um, like a, a, a stunning adventure, um, from one of the world's greatest minds. And it's like, you're supposed to mark like the buzzwords that you see on the back of the book. Anyway, um, it's just a lot of the reviews I, I was seeing were like that. Um, and then, uh, but then like the, I don't know, more highbrow kind of, um, reviewers were saying like, this book is really boring and it's kind of trash. Um, but then it got like, as soon as the book was released, it got uh, caught up for a movie deal um it came out in 2018 it flopped really hard um and a lot of the reasons that were being given were because if donna tart is really good at listing nouns then that's just props in the movie you're showing a bunch of props in the movie that does not make a movie interesting um you need to have so much more that goes into a movie than just the scenery um and uh that's a lot of what I was seeing was wrong with it but then as soon as the movie was released um people were starting to reevaluate the book and going like wow this book is actually kind of bad um and i was kind of sitting there going like i told you so but again i am just a person on the internet um and yeah that's my big complaints with that and then um not to you know punch down not that i'm punching down at all but i wanted to list um a few of the lesser known books um, that I just found really a, a kind of a slog to get through. Um, oh, here's a really good example. So I'm a huge fan of nonfiction, um, especially like nonfiction about really niche topics. I really like to read about like, like things that most people don't like think about, like, like the little disturbing things in our world that are just kind of strange. Um, and so a book that I ended up picking up 
back in high school was this book called Mob Men by Alan Emmons. Um, and it's a book about um, crime scene cleaners. And I thought that was super interesting because back in high school, I was watching, I was binging CSI like there was no tomorrow. And so I wanted to know, like, there was an episode of CSI about crime scene cleaners, but it really didn't go into much detail. And so I was thinking, like, so what happens after all of, like, you know, the the crime scene? Like, there's blood everywhere, there's brains on the wall, like, what's going on? And so I picked up the book because I wanted to find out. Um, the author, um, I think he'd worked for GQ. Um, he ended up teaming up with uh, a well, very, like, relatively well-known uh, crime scene cleaner organization, um, and he just kind of went with them to their projects and saw what they did. Um, and so I was like, wow, that's super interesting. Um, turns out that Alan Emmons barely described anything, um, that was going on. Um, and so a big part of this is that Alan Emmons is a British author, um, and this book took place in the United States. And so for the entire rest of the book, he's going like, wow, that's such an American trait good thing I'm so British because this seems so alien to me because this is American and I am British. And I was like, cool, like I'm Canadian, but that doesn't make me think, wow, that's such an American thing. Like, like, you know, I'm, I'm in Wisconsin right now. That's where I am. Wow. This laptop is so American. This window is so American. Like that's just weird. And so like, how how different can it be between like cleaning up crime scenes in America versus in England? Like, why is this at all relevant into what I'm reading about? Um, and he was just kind of talking about like his his twee British sensibilities. Um, and it was I was like kind of laughing along, going like, "What is wrong with you, dude? Like, I didn't sign up to read a book about you. I signed up to read a book about the crime scene cleaners." Um, and so today, I still don't know what crime scene cleaners do. They use some special chemicals and wipe up blood, and that's all I got. Um, because another thing that was really frustrating about this book was that um, he had a really charismatic main character. Um, Neil Smither was the head of the crime scene cleaners and he was like super crass and like just wanted to get the job done and like kind of like that hardened detective and like any sort of cop show you see and it was a it was a really promising um kind of avenue to take to go into this Neil Smither guy and about why he wanted to get into such a grisly career and he didn't he just talked about Alan Emmons and about how British he is and I was like dude who cares? <laughs> write a biography, like write, write an autobiography. Um, but then the end of the book was just this, this completely random court case that had nothing to do with anything. And he's just going into it going like, is the American justice system wrecked beyond repair? And I'm going, dude, I do not care. I do not give a rat's booty cheek about this. And so like, yeah, um, that's, uh, in my opinion, that is the way to not do nonfiction. Um, do not just talk and ramble about yourself, actually, unless you're doing an autobiography, like advertise it as an autobiography. This was advertised to me as just like a gritty, realistic, um, a, a gritty, realistic look into one of America's most uh, discriminated against jobs. And it was not. It was just Alan Emmons stroking Alan Emmons' ego. Um, and then, uh, uh, okay, so here is a uh, two more books that I want to talk about today. Um, both have a very similar uh, things wrong with them. And we're just going to kind of go in and see what's wrong. Um, and then the, that big problem is that, so I was talking about ambiguous endings. I think amb ambiguous endings, when done well, work great. Um, again, like The Shining, um, it's not wrapped up in a bow, you still have questions, but then you've got that lingering shot at the end of Jack um, in 1922 when the movie takes place in 19, like the 1980s. You see Jack in 1922 hosting a party and you're going, what on earth does that mean? So you get no answers, but it's still an ending, you know? The books that I read had no ending and that was, it just did not work. Um, and so I'll, I'll explain why. Um, again, I don't want to punch down but um, because these are lesser known authors, um, not that I have any place to be punching from, but um, 
yeah, these are lesser known authors, but that doesn't mean that they are bad authors. It just means that I don't like their product. Um, and again, if you end up wanting to read these books, if you want to like disagree with me, that is totally fine. I'm glad you found, um, I'm glad you found joy where I couldn't. Um, so this first book that I want to discuss is The Town That Forgot How to Breathe by Kenneth J. Harvey. Um, so this book is, it's kind of like a paranormal ghost story. And it's about um, this man and his daughter who move into um, uh, like Newfoundland, I think, is where they move to. Um, and uh, they are brand new. They're from like mainland United States, I think. And suddenly um, there's a bunch of like perfectly preserved corpses from like the 17th century that just start popping up out of the sea. And then all of these characters just get this thing where they just don't know how to breathe anymore. Like they just stop breathing and they have to be hooked up to ventilators. Um, now that I'm looking back on it, this seems a lot like very familiar, um, but uh, there's anyway, um, so, it's advertised as having this one main, main character, um, which is Joseph Blackwood. Um, and he, uh, they're on vacation and they're like, they just want to see what's going on. Um, but he's advertised as the main character, um, even though the perspective shifts to other characters in the town throughout the entire book, which I thought was really cool. I kind of like that um, no main character kind of, um, kind of trope. Um, but the thing is that they do focus a lot on Joseph throughout the entire book. And he's just terrible. Like, he's a terrible person. Um, his neighbor is written as this super, super stereotypically attractive woman. Um, she's described as, like, literally having, like, the biggest eyes and thin hips and big breasts. And it's like, oh my god, just give me a break. Um, but so, like, this is talking about Joseph and I'm like, okay, can we get to another character who's really interesting? Like, the doctor in town was really interesting, and then there's, like, the mechanic and all this. Like, they're really interesting, and then it's just focusing on this character that is not. Um, and uh, so then the ending comes along. Um, a kind of uh, a consistent character throughout this entire book has been this, like, uh, kind of, like, old mysterious woman who's lived on... A, who's lived in the town forever and she's very old and probably is magic. Um, uh, but anyway, the town seems to be flooding at the end. And um, then the, his favorite, like the author's favorite characters all get picked up by a helicopter. The old woman stays behind and she's like, well, this disease never existed before the television and the telephone. And then all the characters fly away and the town gets flooded and at the end. And it's like, there was no explanation giving it, given as to this disease um, besides, you know, modern technology ruined it for all of us, which, yeah, I don't think anyone's gonna, like, deny to you that there are bad things about modern technology. That is a given. Like, th that's not an ending. Um, and there is a trope called no ending, which can work, but this just doesn't. Like, you have to give me something more than that. Um... Anyway, the second book that I'm going to go into is, um, it's called The Sin Eater's Confession by Ilsa J. Bick. This book made me so mad. Um, and okay, so it's about this boy named Ben, and he is a high school student, and yada yada yada, he's going about his life. He's, he's made this friend, um, a male friend, and it kind of starts to be seeming like they're more than friends. And then his friend gets murdered, like brutally murdered. Um, it's described very, very graphically. Um, and Ben like is is sick and runs away and like, cause Ben witnessed the murder. Um, understandable, I would be sick too if I witnessed a murder. Then he goes back and like sees the corpse and it's also described super, super graphically. And then Ben spends the entire rest of the book going like, oh my god, am I gay? Am I not gay? I think I might be gay, but maybe I'm not gay. And then um, at the very end, he sees this girl possibly get kidnapped, and then the end. Um, he says that he's been drafted into the army, or like he, he went to the army, and he's writing a letter back home, and he says something like, 
I never found out who murdered my friend, but that's how real life is. This isn't a book or a movie, wink wonk. Um, except, broski, this is a book and you didn't finish it. Like, you just decided not to finish the book? You kind of, you can't do that, bud. Like, I need an ending. Um, it can be an ambiguous ending, but it needs to be an ending. Like, we had no idea who killed the guy's friend. We had no idea if this girl actually got kidnapped or not. And that's it. And it's like, it was it was extremely unfulfilling, um, and that's the reason why I hated it so much. Is it actually had kind of snowed me at the beginning? I was like, hmm, this is something to think about. Life isn't like a book or a movie. Except, wait, this is a book, and so like, I hope there's a sequel because what the hell? Um, yeah. Anyway, um, so, and then the whole you know, am I gay? Am I not gay? Thing. Um, this author said that she wanted it to be a coming of age type story. Um, which again, why would you describe a murder so brutally and graphically if it's a coming of age story and not a murder mystery? Like, you see what I mean? Like, uh, he, genres are nebulous and moldable, but you can't just like take what you like out of one and then ditch the rest. Like, that's not how it works. Um, there's there has to be some sort of resolution beyond just screw you um and then again you know the sexuality thing ben ultimately came to the conclusion that he was straight which like is kind of disappointing um as a queer person myself i was reading that going like hmm so the entire thing results in coming out as straight interesting um you know straight people don't have to come out hmm. um and so yeah that was it was you know unfulfilling um and so yeah that's all i have for today um uh i know that sarah likes to end with a writing prompt and so i know i've been talking a lot about tropes this and uh this entire time so this is just something i wanted uh to give you to think about i'm not gonna like set a timer or anything just because i think it might be a longer prompt but just like um i think that a lot of what i've been talking about can result in excellent parody i think that a lot of really good parody comes out of um taking the tropes out of like taking tropes you like out of a genre or, uh, format that you don't like and turning it into something hilarious or turning it into something really profound and so that's what I'm inviting you all to do is um think about the tropes of maybe a genre that you don't like like say if you don't like horror blasphemy but if you don't like horror what is it you don't like about horror is it like the graphic violence is it um jump scares maybe and then write something that utilizes um like jump scares and make it a funny story about jump scares um, and why you don't like that. And then also, um, I just invite you to take some time to think about the books and movies um, that you don't like and think about why you don't like them. Um, and uh, maybe like come to come to terms with why you don't like them. That's something I really like to do is hate on things. Um, obviously, I like to complain. So um, thank you so much for joining me and remember to write more light into your life.